I really kind of want to talk a little bit about what the Show Me Institute is about because uh, when we talk about tax issues, education issues, it's from a very specific point of view. It's from the free market point of view, our slogan, where liberty comes first. It's very uh, liberty, freedom oriented. But what's that really mean? And, and when I first came to the Institute about five years ago, a lot of my talks focus really strictly on the economics of it, trying to get that very clear. Uh, and, and those are relatively easy talks because the economics oftentimes are, are pretty straightforward. But it would always omit a very important element of the discussion. And particularly in healthcare, uh, it's, it's an extremely important point in the discussion. Uh, when we talk about free markets, when we talk about liberty coming first, when we talk about freedom, uh, what we're really talking about is people. When we say that we believe in the free market, what we're saying is that we believe in a free people to make their lives better off, uh, to make uh, this city, this state, this country, and this world a better place. And that's not really an ambitious thing to say. I mean, the, the arc of human history suggests that when you empower the individual, a lot of great things can happen. Um, and so when folks who are more uh, interested in putting power in government, when they think that they have this kind of moral authority to, to talk about health care, for instance. It's always fascinating to me because it disempowers the individuals far too much and far too often as well. I, I, I view the free market movement to be a very moral movement, and it's efficient and it's effective. That's what the economic side of it is. But fundamentally, when we're talking about free markets, we're talking about people. And that's hugely important to, to, to keep in mind uh, as we go through this discussion. This is a picture of people. I was told in my last presentation that they thought this came from a uh, toothpaste commercial, which I can understand. But when I see this, I think they're all happy about being in a market. So, much happy people, uh, markets are people. Um, one thing that we need to keep in mind when we talk about healthcare is that prior to the Affordable Care Act, there, it wasn't really a halcyon time of free market health care. In fact, it hadn't been that way for a very long time. Uh, since World War II, starting with wage and price controls, there was this movement towards a third party payer system, an insurer who would pay basically for your maintenance plan, which you'd obviously pay the insurer, of course, but you didn't necessarily see the, the price of the things that you were buying. Uh, compensation started to tilt toward benefits. Today we have about 30% of our uh, compensation in benefits. Uh, that is a real problem when we're talking about um, if you want to keep your salary up, for instance, because employers, generally speaking, have a pretty finite amount of money that they can spend on compensation. And when the cost of your benefits rise, that puts pressure on your salary as well. So there are real uh, consequences not only to your health care spending, but also to other spending that you might do as well. Um, today there are tax advantages to employers providing uh, health insurance. That's part of the reason why it's become so prevalent and remains so prevalent. Um, but domination of insurance as a way of paying for kind of a maintenance plan isn't necessarily typical. Uh, your home insurance doesn't pay for uh, your lawn to be cut, for instance, or at least mine does, and I don't know how often, how often you see that, but that's not typical. And health insurance, health insurance pays for the maintenance plan, and that's really what you're paying for. And I'll get into a, an example about cell phones here in a few minutes, but it, it, when we talk about health insurance, usually what we're really talking about is the maintenance plan that is part of that, that package. It's not necessarily just about the insurance. Um, so prior to the Affordable Care Act, we really didn't have a free market in health care. Uh, we had a third party payer system that Dame. We had cost problems. Uh, we have a broken Medicaid program and had a broken Medicaid program. We had access problems and we had frequent regulatory restrictions to competition, which I'll go into at, at, at some length here uh, at the end. Uh, first, cost problems. Prior to the Affordable Care Act, between 2000 and 2010, the average individual uh, had premiums doubled from $2,400 to about $5,000 a year. Uh, that was mirrored in family premiums as well, from $6,400 to $13,000. Um, this is not, uh, this is well above inflation. Uh, this is uh, putting, that put pressure on salaries. It, it is part of the reason why I think that Congress thought that they could act in some fashion uh, on, with, with the Affordable Care Act itself. Um, the mistake, of course, is that uh, with the Affordable Care Act, they dealt somewhat with demand issues, made things worse, really, but they didn't really deal with supply issues, which, again, we'll talk about later. Um, we had a broken Medicaid program, so we have 
costs escalating in the private market. You also have costs escalating when you talk about public services uh, in, in the Medicaid program itself. Between 2000 and 2010, uh, the cost of the spending from the state and the federal levels doubled from 200 billion to about 400 billion dollars. It continues to rise. Uh, by 2022, we're going to hit about a trillion dollars a year just on Medicaid, Medicaid spending alone. Um, and when I say broken, it's not just about cost, it's also about health outcomes. Uh, Ovik Roy, who is an editor at Forbes, he's a think tank guy, very smart, very sharp, he talks about this at length. And it's not just about the cost, like I said, but it's also about the outcomes that we're actually getting from, from our Medicaid system. University of Pennsylvania, colon cancer mortality in the Medicaid program is actually higher than if you had uh, no insurance at all. And you see this across a, ser a series of different uh, disease, uh, uh, different diseases, different uh, surgical uh, uh, procedures as well. There was a study that was done uh, four or five years ago in Oregon. They actually looked at primary care, not necessarily surgical or, or disease related care, but primary care. And what they found was that not only did Medicaid not increase life expectancy, but it actually increased the cost of care in general because it actually compelled people or uh, convinced people to go to the emergency room even when that care is the most expensive care. That was one of the, the selling points of the Affordable Care Act, supposedly, was that it would decrease emergency room usage. Uh, and that really hasn't borne itself out. Oregon expanded Medicaid before Obamacare. They had their own program, but they had a limited amount of money that they could spend on it. And so the only way that they could really serve anybody, right, instead of like picking and choosing, was they created a lottery. So you had two discrete groups. It was uh, completely randomized. And when they looked at the results of those who did receive Medicaid and those who did not receive Medicaid, uh, there really was no difference in health outcomes for, for strictly primary care. Um, but the access problems that we see in Medicaid, uh, and I'll jump down there real quickly, um, access to care is not good for Medicaid patients. In 2008, 42% of primary care physicians were accepting new Medicaid patients. About 84% were accepting privately insured payments. A lot of this had to do with reimbursement levels, but we also have another uh, problem off to the side here with primary care physicians who uh, either aren't going into primary care, they're going into a specialty, which decreases the availability of primary care physicians. And a lot of these primary care physicians aren't necessarily distributed across the country uh, in uh, proportion to the population itself. So you, it, it, it is in some part a shortage of physicians, but we also have this maldistribution where a lot of physicians may be gravitating towards larger cities. So you may have enough if you force people to move to other places, but we're, we're America, we're not going to do that. So you have this maldistribution, you, you're not able to get the care to people who, who really need it. This is particularly true in rural areas. So if you have a rural Medicaid patient, um, one, the care is not necessarily going to be great anyway, but two, to the extent that you can get care, um, that, that's an open question, in fact. Um, and then finally, frequent regulatory restrictions to competition. Certificate of need basically dictates uh, what sorts of services can be offered uh, by a, a, a potentially new clinic. So MRI, CT scans are, are oftentimes, if you look at state CON laws, are often wrapped up in that. Um, and the idea there was originally in the 60s, they wanted to uh, make sure that uh, competing hospitals or competing clinics didn't put each other out of business. And so the idea was, well, we're going to create a monopoly or an oligopoly and uh, that's how we're going to keep costs low and a guarantee access when it really, the research shows it didn't do that. Um, State-based insurance regulation, provider uh, licensing restrictions, which I'll talk about in a bit in scope of practice. Um, all those deal with kind of market-oriented uh, issues that either we need to move toward or move away from. Certificate of need, we need to move away from. State-based insurance regulation, uh, I think we need to move away from, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, it's not necessarily a silver bullet, uh, as, as we might hope it would be. Pro provider licensing restrictions is a big one in scope of practice. Um, all these elements are parts of what I think a, uh, a free market reform, what, they ha what we have to deal with. It was a mistake to rush the Affordable Care Act through. Um, how many people have seen the movie Sully? 
Okay, there's a scene in the movie where he pulls out a little fortune cookie fortune from his wallet. And I saw that and thought, well, is that, is that a true story? You know, it's a true story, the whole thing, but does he act, did he actually have this thing? And he did. He actually kept it on his clipboard for every time he'd go through and make sure that everything was right with the airplane. And uh, on this fortune cookie, it says a delay is better than a disaster. Um, and I think when we're talking about healthcare reform, it was rushed through, and we can talk about the procedural side of it, uh, but this is such a huge part of the economy uh, and has been such a huge problem for so long that rushing it through was a gigantic mistake to the extent that the pre-Obamacare problems are also our post-Obamacare problems. Uh, not a whole lot has substantively changed. We, we, the way that we uh, administer our health insurance system has certainly changed, um, but it hasn't changed for the better. It has, in a lot of respects, changed for the worse. Uh, we still have a third-party payer system that dominates. We have cost problems. We have access problems. We still have a broken Medicaid system, uh, and we still have frequent regulatory restrictions and competition. Uh, all these things keep costs higher, and it, and it uh, decreases access to necessary health care services. And this is, again, when, when I talk about the free market reforms that we're talking about, uh, it is incumbent that we recognize that we're trying to, to meet health, uh, the needs of people here. Um, and when we go through these reforms, this is about making life better for folks, and it's by empowering the individual that we do that. Uh, prices are signals, and yet too often we don't see them firsthand. Uh, can anybody identify what, what this is? It's an iPhone. Okay, it's an iPhone. Now before saying anything out loud, think for a moment about how much an iPhone costs, or how much you would value it at. Okay, so if you won a free iPhone, won a raffle, won whatever, would you be excited about that? Would you be happy about that? Sure. Okay. Because there, there's value in this phone. If you get it for free, that's even better. What if I walked up to you and said, I would sell you my iPhone for $50? Would, would that change how you felt about the phone that you might receive? I'd wonder where you stole it from. Okay, so you'd wonder where I stole it from. No, that's, and that's a great point. Um, you, you'd wonder whether it was stolen. Uh, maybe it's broken, okay? Uh, what if I tried to sell it to you for $5,000? Yeah, okay. So you know about how much an iPhone costs, uh, but so you wouldn't pay $50 because $50 actually represents information. That actually tells you something about the product before you've even received it. And $5,000 is too much, you have alternatives that you can purchase as well. Uh, but you know that this is not valued at $5,000. What about a hip replacement? What if I told you a hip replacement costs $25,000? Does that seem fair? <laughs> what about $125,000? Does that seem like a good deal? No idea. Okay, yeah. And mo for the most part, we don't know exactly w how much a lot of these, these goods and services cost. I mean, even it, it doesn't just apply to goods like with an iPhone. Uh, this is a, a dry cleaning operation in Kansas City. We generally know what dry cleaning costs. Um, but a lot of times with healthcare, it's kind of a black box. We don't necessarily know what the actual value is of the care that we'd be receiving. And so one of the, one of the, the actual nice things about the Affordable Care Act, and it might be one of the only, is that they required more transparency of hospitals. And so you at least get to see what the prices are that they, the, their, their master price list for certain procedures. And when you look at the, the list of, of what these different hospitals charge, hip replacements can range from 125000 to uh, or $25,000 to $125,000, um, and all sorts of procedures that you wouldn't think would, would range from $6,000 to $130,000. You can see, actually see it in some of this, this data, and it's pretty remarkable. Um, and it's not just based off of geography. I think uh, the lowest cost for a hip replacement was in Oklahoma. The highest was in California. But even within cities, you have pretty massive variation in, in, in the prices for a lot of these procedures. 100%, um, 200%, 300% more from one hospital to the next. Now, there is variation in terms of quality. If you have the, the best surgeon in the country, absolutely, that, that's going to be more expensive. But for the most part, we really don't know <laughs> what that incremental cost ends up looking like for that higher quality. And a lot of times we don't really know which doctors ought to be being, or which hospitals should be paying, or should be receiving that kind of money. 
This is, this is why having transparent pricing is so important. Uh, we wrote a paper last year uh, talking about direct primary care. And in direct primary care, what they do is they actually disintermediate uh, insurers. Not only that, but they also post their prices. Um, and real quickly, I'll jump over to, um, there are two kinds of uh, direct care. One is surgical care, one is primary care. This is Surgery Center of Oklahoma. Surgery Center Oklahoma actually posts all of its prices online. Uh, it's all in pricing. So here's ten, so $10,700 for a femoral pop lidial bypass. I don't know what that is. Um, but um, you can actually compare prices. You can actually figure out what uh, your particular procedure will cost you. Um, true, it's also true with direct primary care. The important thing here, and I, I visited Oklahoma City and they, they briefed us basically on some of the situations they had with their patients. There will be patients that employers will send from Alaska, from all over the country, here because in their neck of the woods, a procedure like this could cost 10 times as much. Uh, and if you're a self-insured employer, uh, you can save a lot of money by sending them to this really high quality uh, surgical center. Um, but a lot of this has to do with having transparent pricing, which in most of, of the marketplace, and, I, and when I say marketplace, I don't mean Affordable Care Act marketplace, I mean an actual marketplace where people are negotiating prices, you just simply don't see it. Um, it's that, it's that uh, when you don't have those prices, you actually don't have information. And that's why prices are so important in healthcare, and we talked about that at length. Um, I don't know if we have copies of this, but you can find it online. Um, we also have talked about our broken Medicaid program. Um, what we would suggest, or what I would suggest, is moving the Medicaid program more towards kind of an HSA uh, sort of system where there are actually incentives on the, for the individual to actually save money. And the details are in the paper itself. I don't want to get too, too uh, off beaten path with that. But when we talk about cost access and regulation, um, we have a paper that's coming out this week talking about supply, supply side reforms that can actually help our healthcare system. Uh, and particularly when we're talking about supplies, I like talking about licensing reforms. Um, uh, this, is, this talks about it as well. This is a certificate of need. When we're talking about certificate of need, this is a great situation where in the 60s, they thought that they could guarantee access by basically controlling the supply of providers. Uh, and that, that simply didn't work. Um, what you ended up seeing, and this was shown pretty consistently, most recently in a Mercatus study, that uh, the cost of care actually rose and access to care fell, which makes a lot of sense uh, because the supply of providers, the supply of services was being constrained. A lot of states have actually moved away from certificate of need. The state of Missouri is a certificate of need state um, that in my view is a, a problem across the, the border in Kansas. Uh, they don't have certificate of need and they have uh, health centers, hospitals open up pretty frequently uh, and it's good for competition. But in, in Missouri, we simply don't have it as well as Oklahoma, Arkansas, uh, Nebraska. You can see all the states around there. Um, interstate insurance products. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that, particularly four or five years ago, Georgia passed a law that would allow out-of-state insurance products to be sold, but you also had to, they, insurers had to actually have those products licensed in the state of Georgia anyway. Real quickly on insurance products, I think one, the hope was that if, uh, if states would allow for insurance products from other states to, to be marketed, uh, that you would see a decrease in costs. Unfortunately, in Georgia, you, you really didn't see that, and that's partly because of the third-party payer system. It isn't so much about insurance, it's still uh, mainly about a maintenance plan. And so uh, these insurers could try to market these out-of-state insurance plans to the state of Georgia, uh, but they wouldn't have the hospital networks that particularly under the Affordable Care Act you have to have to even be able to function in any of these marketplaces. So I think when, if we can get to a place where insurance actually represents insurance in healthcare, um, having interstate insurance uh, will be a great boon to, to be able to decrease costs and increase access to care in, in this country. But until we get to that point, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a slow slog and scope of practice reforms as well. Um, when you're talking about uh, uh, inoculations, there are some, some inoculations that nurse practitioners can do, some that they can't. Um, if you look at um, the way that Medicare uh, 
pays for services, so just in identical services. They pay nurse practitioners less than what they pay doctors for. And there's no particularly good reason for it, and it has nothing to do with quality of care. So there are a lot of cases, I think, where we can, we can look at reforming the way that uh, reimbursements are issued, uh, and, and how we value those services and also make sure that nurse practitioners can do more because they're qualified to do more than they actually do in this country. Um, interstate medical licensing. This is a picture of Panama City Beach. If my wife was here, she'd recognize it because this is where we got married. But this is Panama City Beach, Florida. Imagine for a moment that I was walking down the beach and I cut my, my foot open, okay? And I had to be rushed to the hospital, get, get some stitches. Do you think there would be any point at which I would be concerned that I wouldn't be able to find a Missouri licensed doctor? No, no, there really isn't because a Missouri licensed doctor is basically the same as a Florida licensed doctor. But the, the point of, of, of licensing should ultimately be to make sure that the folks who are practicing, if you're going to have a license, that you are able to do the job that you say that you're going to do. It, it helps. Consumers uh, recognize whether or not this person is qualified to be a doctor, but it shouldn't act as a barrier to entry. So imagine instead of me traveling to Florida, why can't the doctor travel from Florida to the state of Missouri? There are a couple of ways this, this could happen. They could physically be present. Uh, they could also uh, commute in through telemedicine. That's another, another option. And what you find with telemedicine in particular is that telemedicine, if you're going to conduct telemedicine, let's say I'm a resident of the state of Missouri, uh, the doctor on the other end of the line has to be licensed in the state of Missouri as well. It depends on where the uh, patient is located, not where the doctor is located. The doctor can treat patients in Florida or treat patients in Illinois or treat patients in Kansas, uh, but he can't treat a patient that's in Missouri. And that seems kind of unusual. Um, it, it, and so what we're really talking about here is licensed uh, reciprocity. Um, it's not all that ambitious. In fact, I think most of you took advantage of a license that is accepted across the country called a driver's license. Uh, you're able to operate a two-ton vehicle across state lines without really any obstruction because there are accepted standards across the country for what it takes to be able to drive a car. And there are different ages for uh, 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 in different states for who can drive a car and under what circumstances, but ultimately your driver's license works across the country. It works in some other countries, in fact. Uh, and the fact is that when we're talking about physician's licenses, physician's license should be similar. Um, a, a, decision, a physician's decision to enter a state or participate in a state can oftentimes be dictated by whether or not they have to go through the process of relicensing or they have to go through uh, a process to uh, renew a license. Licenses will expire. Someone will move from Ohio to the state of Missouri. This is a uh, I, I heard from a presentation two times ago, and he just let the one in Ohio expire because it was too much of a, a hassle to try to renew it. Um, we already have kind of a version of interstate medical licensing now. In 2013, we passed the Volunteer Health Services Act, and the Volunteer Health Services Act allowed out-of-state doctors practicing in good standing to provide care for free to Missouri. What would most benefit from it is called remote area medical. And I heard about remote area medical at a Cato conference, and uh, what I found out uh, was that they had tried to come to uh, uh, Joplin uh, after the tornado had hit. And uh, they had sent an eyeglass van because they have optometrists from around the country that'll help doctors, uh, uh, dentists, all sorts of, but, but in this case, they sent an eyeglass van down to give out free eyeglasses. And uh, I was talking to the uh, the guy who founded the organization called, his name Stan Brock, and he said, yeah, we got down there and uh, we had an optometrist in, in the truck, uh, but uh, the local authorities wouldn't let us <laughs> actually give away free eyeglasses because uh, there wasn't an optometrist to preside over it that, that was willing to preside over it. Um, and I found that to be incredibly offensive. Um, we're talking about something that is substantively an emergency situation. Um, and yet, and, and we have qualified optometrists providing this care, providing, providing these glasses, and they were forced to go home without being able to help anybody. Um, so this reform gets passed. Um, so we have uh, interstate licensing of sorts already in the state. The question really is whether it's okay to say, well, 
If you're willing to provide telemedicine to someone in a rural community or if you're able to come from Arkansas and help someone across the border, uh, should you be able to do that as part of your regular practice? And the, I think the answer is yes. Um, and, and like I said, I think there's a, for, for physicians, uh, licenses do act as kind of a barrier. Imagine if your, your driver's license only allowed you to travel in the state of Missouri. Uh, would you drive any place else if you had to relicense every state that you went to? Alternatively, if we had folks in Texas or Oklahoma who wanted to go to the Lake of the Ozarks and enjoy some of our, our fine lakes and fine golf courses, would they come? Maybe not. If they had to relicense to come into the state, to, to drive into the state, they may, may make different decisions. And similarly, these are, these are obviously different, but the licensure element, the effect can still be the same, is that people will make other decisions, doctors will make other decisions about the kind of practice that they want to pursue. And ultimately, that can mean less access to care, which I'll, I'll try to demonstrate in a second. This can look a lot of different ways. The state could pass a law that says if you have a, a license in another state and you're in good standing with your particular licensing board, we will accept your license as is and you can come into the state. Uh, politically, it may require bilateral reciprocity. You may have to have Kansas pass a law that says we'll accept Missouri doctors and Missouri, doc Missouri pass a law that says we'll accept Kansas doctors. Um, I would be completely fine saying we'll take all doctors period, um, but uh, bilateral reciprocity, I think, is uh, may, may be uh, what's required. Uh, can you all see that? No? no? Okay, so I blew it up. Um, that is uh, from the Federation of State Medical Boards, and what, they, what they've done is they've gone through and they've counted up the number of uh, licensed physicians in each state. Um, there are about 900,000 licensed physicians in the United States. About 25,000, 26,000 are in the state of Missouri, which means that there are about 900, or 875,000 doctors who are licensed to practice in other states, who, who could practice in this state, uh, and while they may not be able to practice physically, and not all, not all, certainly not all doctors would be participating in this kind of interstate licensing program anyway, because it, they may just be disinterested in it. But if you're talking about telemedicine, if you're talking about all sorts of things, if you want to lower cost, you want to increase supply, and there's a lot of supply out there. Um, at the bottom you see uh, there are 1.2 million licenses. That means it's not uncommon for doctors to try to get a license in another state. But just because they've gotten a license in another state, it doesn't mean that they're a license in every state. Um, and that offers opportunities. We know that there's an interest in having interstate practices. The question is whether uh, we can expand it not to just one or two states, but to 30, 40, 50 states. Uh, and then particularly as technology uh, improves, I think we're going to see a lot of opportunities there as well. And finally, healthcare is not just about insurance. I hope, I hope that that's at least somewhat clear from, from this presentation because the Affordable Care Act focused on insurance, but that's not really uh, the driving factor in. Uh, the, the decrease in access, the increase in cost that we really see in our healthcare system. Uh, it's also about supply. It's not just about demand on, on insurance, it's also about supply of providers as well. And until we can get to a place where we can actually see prices or demand that we have a supply that actually reveals these prices, it's going to be very difficult to get our hands around the cost element of our healthcare problems. Um, before the Affordable Care Act, we had problems. After the Affordable Care Act, we have worse problems, really, um, and, and that is uh, why this is such a live issue even today. Uh, interstate licensing in particular, I think, provides, offers low-hanging fruit uh, to make healthcare better, more accessible, less expensive, um, and, and ultimately, I think that we are best served when we are empowering individuals. Um, it's true in tax policy, it's true in education, it's true in healthcare. Um, and I think that if you operate from a, a, a place where you're trying to have a bottom-up solution rather than a top-down, I think more often than that you're going to have much better results than what we've had in healthcare, uh, certainly over the last 70 years and certainly over the last five years. So a lot that can be done, uh, a lot that has to be done at the federal level, but there's a lot we can do at the state level as well. So 